Dear invited guests, dear fellows of the Royal Physiographic Society, ladies and gentlemen, you're most welcome to this symposium, The Thinking Animal, a symposium organized by the Royal Physiographic Society here in Lund. It's an old Royal Academy founded in 1772 and uh, has of later years, a very nice tradition of organizing uh, symposium, symposia, uh, both with more national, but also of more international character. We are very, very pleased to have such uh, distinguished guests here on a topic that obviously fascinates a lot of people. When I was a kid, I was concerned about individual cereal grains in my breakfast cereals, if they fell out of the box and were found on the floor underneath the chairs or the table. I thought they felt alone. What I did was, of course, the childish way of endowing inanimate objects, feelings, emotions, thoughts, and even some, at some level, some intelligence possibility or a capability to reflect on things. And I think we all do that in our everyday lives, perhaps not in that childish way of endowing inanimate objects, emotions or cognitive capabilities, but we do so with a lot of animals, we know for sure. And uh, we see what they do, how they behave and how they sound, and we try to interpret that through a filter of our cognition. <clears throat> now, the, this symposium uh, is a fantastic possibility to learn more about how we can probe into those inner secrets of things that we cannot talk to. Uh, and I'm certainly, and I'm sure you are too, very much looking forward to hearing all those fantastic insights. And I'd like to thank uh, the organizers, Eric Warren and Matthias Oswat, for putting all this together. And we are very, very proud as hosts at the Royal Physiographic Society. So, most welcome. I think I've got, yes, I have, okay. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Eric Warrant, and I'm one of the two organisers of this symposium, uh, the other being Matthias Osvath, who's sitting here, who unfortunately has hurt his back really badly. Um, so he's sitting down, but he's going to say a few words as well in a moment. Um, but as I say, a warm welcome also to our distinguished uh, lecturers who are uh, world authorities on the topic of, the, of today's symposium on comparative animal cognition, um, which is a very, very fascinating topic, as Pear has already alluded to. And, um, but before we start, there's just a couple of small practical details. As you know, uh, we're having lunch and morning and afternoon tea in the program. That's all taken care of. The lunch is across... For those, those of you who don't know the layout of this university, actually, I'm sorry to say it's the 350th anniversary of the university this year, and we're having a huge party in this park outside tomorrow. Uh, and that's why I hardly even know my, round, my way around this university at the moment. But for those of you who don't know the layout of Lund, the building we're having lunch in is Akademiska Vereningen, which is this red, big old red building sort of behind me. Uh, we'll sort of, you'll see lots of people walking over there uh, at, at lunchtime. Um, another practical thing is if you need to use the bathrooms, uh, they're just straight down these ramps that you've just walked up and in this open area at the bottom you'll find uh, both a, a, a men's and women's uh, toilet there. And that's in this general area, not in the toilets, but behind there, we'll be having morning and afternoon tea as well at the times in the schedule. Um, but coming back at least to the, to the symposium, and um, this symposium, as Pears already mentioned, is a symposium to explore the idea that other animals, apart from ourselves, might actually be able to think and possibly even have intelligence. And this is a, this is a question that has interested people since time immemorial. And in fact, the ancient Greeks 
um, like ourselves, have been interested in the idea of trying to classify nature into different ranks. Um, and this classic idea of the scala naturae, which was first, um, first formulated by Aristotle, by Aristotle um, explains that, well, he first classified um, all living things into a kind of a ladder, a kind of a scale, starting with inanimate objects at the bottom and ending with man, ourselves, uh, humans, at the very top. And that there is a kind of a rank of life that occurs between those two extremes, where you have fungi at the next level, followed by plants, um, and followed by other plants, and then sort of invertebrate, lower invertebrates from, from marine habitats, followed by insects and other invertebrates and, and various kinds of mollusks, through the, up to the, the uh, amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals, and then finally ourselves in this order. And this has kind of stuck in the mentality of people since this time. And during the medieval era, uh, the only thing that really changed here was that uh, medieval thinkers decided to put God on top of the whole lot and then stick angels under God and actually move snakes to the bottom. <laughs> but uh, this general idea sort of started to disappear with Linnaeus with the new classification system. But nonetheless, many aspects of this kind of ladder, if you like, of nature, this this ranking of nature, even stuck in terms of cognitive abilities of animals. And there is a, um, a very well-known German neuro neurologist from the uh, 19th century, Ludwig, Ludwig Edinger, who first tried to use this kind of scale to suggest that the cognitive abilities of animals also were kind of ranked on a cognitive ladder with, in the case of vertebrates, which were the group of animals that he was most interested in, starting with fish and amphibians and reptiles at the bottom, with greater levels of complexity evolving um, if, with higher levels in the vertebrate world, ending, of course, with ourselves, with the biggest and best brain of all. And this kind of idea, this kind of simple thinking, um, stuck for a very long time. And it's only been in the last couple of decades, really, that this view has changed entirely. And the speakers that we have with us today have been instrumental in changing this view. That no longer is it just simply some kind of crude ranking of animals according to some ancient scaling system, but actually many animals, surprisingly, uh, what we would have otherwise thought of as being lowly ranked animals, have surprising cognitive skills. And it's this topic today that the symposium is going to be dealing with. Uh, and as I say, we have some of the world's leading experts in this uh, topic with us today, and it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much for agreeing to come. Um, but uh, I'm going to stop talking now and uh, hand you over to Matthias, because Matthias is the person at our university, at least, who um, has invested the most energy into this topic uh, here. And uh, Matthias is... Uh, a, uh, he calls himself a cognitive zoologist, and I think that's a fantastic uh, term. Uh, and he's done a lot of wonderful work, especially with um, birds and, and chimpanzees. And uh, he's going to take us for a little bit of a deeper dive into this topic first before we introduce our first speaker. Over to you, Matthias. Thank you very much. So today I'm a living proof of evolution, <laughs> um, an intelligently designed um, human body wouldn't look like this. <laughs> so um, this is what happens if you're a quadruped standing on your hind limbs too long. Anyway, animal cognition. Uh, that's a very young science, but it probably has one of the longest historical roots. So, and I dare to say that most humans throughout times have wondered what is going on in the minds of other animals long before there was any systematic science or philosophy. And also we find in the first documented work from philosophers from millennia ago, already then they start to think about cognition and animal cognition or how human cognition relates to uh, other animals. And for 3,000 years or so, there has been very different views on animal cognition. So it was not actually until Darwin came along that we got an underlying fabric where we could attach our speculations. But, uh, and Darwin himself, he actually realized this fact 21 years ahead of on origins of species. He, he realized that evolution will tell us something about cognition. 
So in his notebook M from 1838, he scribbled down that he who understands baboon will do more towards metaphysics than Locke. In modern terms, that means uh, if you study animal cognition, you will learn something about uh, cognition as a natural phenomenon. Uh, however, in Darwin times, there was not very good um, or well-developed psychology or neurobiology. So the work that was done on animal cognition back then was uh, not really science. It was very anecdotal and um, the methods more or less did not exist. So to, to make a long story short, to mend these methodological problems, uh, at least two branches, scientific branches, saw their first light um, in the beginning of the last century. So it was ethology, which branched off from zoology uh, in Europe. And then you have comparative psychology in the US, which is of course psychology. And both of these were focusing very much on methods, so they developed quite good objective method, methods of measuring animal behavior. And of course they argued a lot with one another because um, in ethology it's all about instincts or was all about instincts and innateness and comparative psychology is all about learning. But then they realized that yeah, learning abilities are innate. Uh, anyway, what they had in common was that they didn't talk about uh, cognitive processes. Many of them agreed that animals probably have cognitive processes but it's too difficult to measure. So they kind of avoided it. And what is so difficult about cognition, actually? Many people think it's because you can't see it, that's why it's difficult to measure. But a lot of things in science, you can't see, still we measure it. And it's not that animals don't speak, that is a, the major theoretical problem, it's a big practical problem though. It's more that cognition is a very strange phenomenon. It is as if the future affects the present. We don't like that. We like nice causality. Because cognition is all, almost always about the upcoming. Even if you move your hand towards a glass of water, it is as if something in the future governs you. That is the major theoretical uh, conundrum when it comes to cognition. So that's why many people have avoided it. But in the mid-50s or so, the cognitive revolution came along. Uh, a lot of uh, different disciplines converged. So it was a neurobiology, linguistics, uh, philosophy, and so on, psychology, of course. However, that didn't come into the field of animal cognition immediately. It took a while. Uh, and if I would put a date, which I shouldn't, um, on when this field really arose as a coherent field, more or less. I would say the late 80s, the beginning of the 90s. That's when we, uh, the first journal called Animal Cognition was founded, at least. So, today, we're going to listen to the frontiers in this field, 2017. What has happened during these years? And I wish you all welcome, and I hope you have a nice time. Thank you. <laughs>